Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC. Hello and welcome, CC. Hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. <laughs> there we go, rolling. If you get your film on PBS, it's a hugely uh, important deal for any filmmaker to do that. The great thing about PBS is that it has all of this national exposure, but the, the bad thing about getting it on PBS and not being a part of a show on PBS is that a lot of stations won't really know how to pick it up or when to schedule it. But there are programs like Independent Lens is one and POV is another that are uh, essentially curated showcases for documentaries. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 93. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. We get a lot of emails from listeners of TDL these days, and we absolutely love each and every one of them. In fact, we've been sharing more and more of these emails here on the show. These emails usually contain some sort of personal introduction, a current project that they're working on, maybe how they found our show, and then a question or suggestion for a topic or guest. Sometimes we'll get unsolicited offers from doc filmmakers who are interested in being a guest here on the program. Now, before we get inundated with a bunch of emails this week by doc filmmakers hoping to come onto the show, I will say that, not surprisingly, we have to be very selective of who we bring on the show. We are very intentional with our programming, and we truly make every attempt to bring you content that is of the highest quality. This past year in particular, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that our programming has been exceptional. The topics that we are discussing, the name guests that we're having on the show have really been incredible. And so most of the time, and I'd say like 90% of the time, when a doc filmmaker sends us a film and suggests that we might be you know, interested in having them onto the show, we will politely decline. And I should say that it's often less about maybe the quality of their film or their resume or, or what have you. It's just that we generally have our guests and our topics of discussion selected and scheduled out a couple of months ahead of time. Well, today's guest, he is an exception to all of this. His name is Matt Hames, and Matt already has 14 director credits to his name for documentaries, including two who were picked up by the prestigious PBS program, Independent Lens. More than that, Matt and his wife Beth are of the very select few doc filmmakers who are fortunate enough to be making their livings doing the documentary work. And they've found a way to not only make their livings doing dream projects, but they're developing and producing their docs all of the time, whether through their own production company, Elpheus Media, or by making docs for the company Rooster Teeth, who are one of the single biggest content creators in the world, and are producing award-winning docs through their film branch, RT Docs. So when we come back from a quick break, we'll get right into today's conversation with doc filmmaker and doc lifer Matt Hames. I do think you'll appreciate some of his honesty and insight into the world of doc. And I know that you're going to appreciate his story of how he started making a living following his dreams. As always, thank you for taking the time to join me again today here on The Documentary Life.
Last Monday, October 1st, we began enrollment in the Documentary Academy, our brand new doc filmmaking online courses platform that Steph and I put together over the course of nine months. And it was based on our combined 25 plus years working in the film and TV industry, two and a half years of this podcast, and the numerous personal conversations that we had with many of you doc lifers who told us your biggest needs as doc filmmakers. We took our time with this in order to build something that not only do we think is going to help you now, but will also be helping you in the future of your doc lives and doc films. From this, we came up with the four course tracks of the Academy, Film Foundations, Filmmaking, Film Funding, and Film Distribution. All courses, they come with video tutorials, downloadable actionable worksheets, and an archive of all past live webinars with doc industry guests. During our pre-sales weekend, prior to opening the doors on the Documentary Academy, we were not only offering our lowest price on the four-course bundle at $3.99, but we also included three very special bonuses. A nice-looking Doc Lifer t-shirt, a 15-minute film consultation with myself, and the Journey to Kathmandu DVD-CD soundtrack combo. But once October 1st hit, we began only offering the two bonuses of the 15-minute film consult and the Journey to Kathmandu DVD CD package. At the time of release of this episode, which is Friday, October 5th, there is still time to take advantage of the great bundle price of $399, that's $399, and also still get the two bonuses. However, only a limited time is remaining on this particular offer. You only have through this weekend, actually, because as of Monday, October 8th, the bonus goes down to one, and that will be the Journey to Kathmandu DVD-CD combo. The 15-minute film console, that goes away. So if you've been hesitating on pulling the trigger on the Academy and making the best doc film that you can make, well, now might be the time to jump in on this special offer to enroll in the Documentary Academy. Simply head on over to thedocumentaryacademy.com and sign up today. Make sure that you get that second bonus, the 15-minute doc film consult with me. I want to know about your doc, and I want to help you get the most out of your experience. So you should probably go to thedocumentaryacademy.com today, or even now, while it's still on your mind. Steph and I truly look forward to bringing you the Documentary Academy, and I personally, I hope to be speaking with you soon, Doc Lifer. Matt Hames is a director, writer, and producer known for his two independent lens documentaries, What Was Ours and When I Rise, and also for his documentary series for Rooster Teeth RT Docs. His films have screened at South by Southwest, Hot Docs, IDFA, AFI, the Santa Barbara Film Festival, LA Shorts Fest, and Sundance TV. When I Rise was nominated for an IDA award in the category of Best Music Documentary. He is a co-founder of Austin, Texas-based nonfiction production company, Elpheus Media, who produces content for PBS, Rooster Teeth, and others. Matt Hames, welcome to the documentary Life. Glad to have you on today's episode. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be on the show. Why don't we get started out, as we usually do, with a little bit of background. How and why did documentary film happen for you? Well, I think like a lot of documentary filmmakers, it happened to me rather than me trying to make something happen. Originally, I had, um, I'd always done a lot of theater as a child and as a teenager and in college. And uh, then I decided I was sick of that and shifted gears and went to um, film school at the University of North Texas mm. for a little while. Mm. And um, while I was there, it was kind of the beginning of the desktop video revolution, which definitely <laughs> hit me. At, new you know, technologies like After Effects and Premiere and then Final Cut yeah. were, were all coming out. And uh, so I just jumped in and started doing, um, just teaching myself how to do stuff got an internship at a company, got hired by the company. And then um, after that, I kind of went out on my own. And um, then um, s basically someone had a documentary idea that they came to me with mm. and they had already started raising funds. And I jumped in as an editor. And then over time, 
it was clear that um, if I wanted to be the director of it and I, I actually wanted to see it get finished, yeah. that I should just go ahead and step up and do it. So that was the first um, film that I directed. And, and was that Last Best Hope? Yes, it was Last Best Hope. And that's, and that's an interesting start to that. It's not something that we've talked about here on the show, but I like that you brought this idea up. It's not that unusual that this sort of thing happens where you're a part of the documentary and at some point, for whatever the reason or reasons, it doesn't look like the doc's going to get finished and you find yourself in the position of, of perhaps taking the documentary over and directing it yourself. Yeah, I, I was really just a lowly um, editor, and I don't mean to say editors are lowly because it's actually my favorite part of the whole process. Me too. Is editing. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was editing, and um, yeah, the film just, we had a little bit of money. Uh, the two producers that were working on it were awesome, and one of them, uh, the film is about an American uh, pilot that crashed during the Nazi occupation of Europe. He, he crashed in Belgium and, and was taken in by these uh, safe houses and the Belgium resistance. And so at that time that the man, the pilot was still alive and they were just sort of raising money as they went and, um, at, you know, get, bringing back footage. And I started editing it. And then um, eventually it was I, I fell in love with the project. And, and I also didn't have kids at the time. I don't think I guess I had just gotten married, but I was I, I guess you could say somewhat without obligations. Yeah. Uh, and so it was a good time in my life for me to just say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it mostly for free. And uh, and then the passion for the project just kept me going. And I was like, well, we need to go out and get interviews with this person and this person. And because I, as an editor, I was trying to make it work and realizing we didn't have the material we needed. And they were happy to just sort of let me jump in and, and start working on that uh, and wasn't really trying to be a director per se of the project. I just wanted the film to get made. Yeah. You wanted to see the film get made. Yeah. It was such a great story. And then, um, that film got picked up by PBS, um, nationally and we screened it in Belgium and it got into some festivals and, um, and then when PBS aired it nationally, uh, as kind of a standalone, um, special mm. was sort of the beginning of my career as a doc filmmaker. Well, and, and clearly you weren't the only person that loved this. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that jumped out at me in scanning your IMDB was that apparently you were bestowed the decoration of Knight of the Order of the Crown from a Belgian king. How does one get this sort of thing to happen, especially with their first doc? <laughs> well, the short version is a man named Walter Verstraten, who was a Belgian, uh, who was our Belgian producer on the film. He had some connections with the Belgian army, and um, he arranged a screening of the film at the War Museum mm. in Brussels. And the, the screening had a few dignitaries invited. There were the American ambassador was invited. And then when he confirmed that he would come, a lot of other people started confirming, including Prince Philippe, who is now the king of Belgium. And so the prince uh, saw the film. There were members of the Belgian resistance that were very old in their 90s, 80s and 90s that came as well. And wow. the film sort of... I guess so emotional for for all of them that um, that afterwards this process began that took about a year and a half where Prince Philippe would wanted us to to get the knighthood and so <laughs> stoked that about a year and a half later um, <laughs> by King Albert II and he, he was now he's no longer the king but but Philippe is the king and uh, so if you know if some horrible tragedy were to befall Belgium and the majority of the population died, I might be in line for the crown. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> what an honor indeed. Like I said, that just jumped out at me and I, and I had to ask. That, that's beautiful. Now, PBS, public broadcasting here in the, in the U.S., has played a major part in really uh, who you have become as a doc filmmaker. And in particular, Independent Lens. For those doc filmmakers who may be unfamiliar with Independent Lens, it is a program and it airs weekly on PBS here in the U.S. In fact, my first doc film that I worked on, the Cambodian Doc Bomb Hunters, it was a part of Independent Lens programming. Matt, what I'd love to hear from you is I'd love for you if you could go in a bit more detail on, on what Independent Lens is and how you feel it's important for the doc filmmaker. Well, if you get your film on PBS, it's it's huge... Uh, it's a hugely uh, important deal for any filmmaker to do that. But the great thing about PBS is that it has all of this national exposure 
But the, the bad thing about getting it on PBS and not being a part of a show on PBS is that a lot of people or a lot of stations rather won't really know how to pick it up or right. when to yeah. schedule it. So Last Best Hope was aired as a primetime standalone special, but it aired at different times all over the country and it wasn't promoted because there just wasn't a budget to do that. But there are programs like Independent Lens is one and POV is another that are uh, essentially curated showcases for documentaries. And they are run by people that go around to film festivals and really keep their ear to the ground on what's going on. Uh, the lady that runs Independent Lens, is her name is Lois Wasson, and she's just an amazing person that is uh, a very, very sensitive to things that are going on at film festivals all over the country, mm. not just dance and South by, but like all over the place. And she sounds like somebody who might be fantastic to have here on the program. Yes, you should. Okay. She's, she's an amazing person. She is someone that, um, long story short, she, she runs and curates independent lens. And mm. so every year they have a season uh, I'm not sure how many docs they do per season, but they're they're basically taking films that are at festivals and uh, showing them to the wider world. Mm. And then they have a promotion kind of an, their own engine and their own budget to be able to promote it. Right. So the the viewership is really high. It's on prime time in most uh, places around the country. And it's just so important for independent filmmakers to be able to have a program like Independent Lens and POV. Now, I believe it was When I Rise, which was the first doc that was a part of Independent Lens programming. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I was dreaming the same dreams everyone else was dreaming. You knew what you were fighting for. The reason for going to University of Texas, Austin, was I was gonna get a better education. This was the first year black undergraduate students were admitted to UT. Every year, the College of Fine Arts would put on an opera. When the tryouts came, uh, Barbara was a natural. No one thought about the fact that a black woman would be playing the romantic opposite of a white man. The removal of Barbara from this role was not just a local phenomenon. I feel so betrayed. We made this film. It took about three and a half years to make. I made it with uh, the Briscoe Center for American History at UT Austin. And uh, when we were finished with the film, I thought it would have some kind of regional appeal for sure, but didn't really know if it would resonate with mm. a wider audience outside Texas. But um, sure enough, it got into South by Southwest and we screened it at South by Southwest and um, at the Paramount. And, Janet Pearson introduced the film and, and, uh, and she runs South by. And then after uh, the screening, this really nice looking woman walked up to me and said, my name is Lois Fawson and I'm with Independent Lens and love this film and would love to talk to you about having it on the program. And so uh, from there, we did several more festivals. We did Hot Docs and a few others. Uh, and then eventually, I think about a year and a half later, uh, we, we put it on Independent Lens. Yeah, a lot more people got to see it. Um, you know, so it, it was, it was great. And then that helped also with getting the film distribution, a wider distribution. It was on Netflix and iTunes and DVD. Now there's, I think for me, an obvious connection, which jumps out, which is Barbara's involvement in theater. But what was it for you with this story? How did the story come to be for you? So what was ultimately your connection with When I Rise? Well, I really, looking back at a lot of the films that I've made, and I'm still so young that I feel like it's pretentious to try to talk about common themes or threads. <laughs> Let somebody else do that, right? Yeah, but but I do. I did very much connect with Barbara's deep appreciation of family mm. and her um, her family that sort of raised her in this small town in East Texas that uh, that then sort of equipped her to deal with the firestorm of media that she endured as an undergrad mm. in, in, uh, in college when this all was going on. And, and I just, you know, family is a imp really important thing to me. It, it shows up in all of, of my docs in some way. Uh, some, I, I end up just veering the lens to somehow focus on how the family impacts people uh, and formulates people. And, and so with Barbara, you know, when I talked to her about what got her through all of this uh, she, she always would credit this family, this extended family, her aunts and uncles and her brother. Uh -huh. Nar. Um, so I just was really interested in how family can sort of, 
get you grounded enough to deal with bigger things in life. Museums across the world, natives are a relic of the past. You know, we're here today. Our sacred objects help to survive. The items have power as long as creators involved with it. I've come through some dangerous situations. The war messed me up. Then this kept me safe. You would direct another doc six years later that was also picked up for independent lens. And that is the film, What Was Ours? Yeah, well, after I, after When I Rise, um, I was sort of looking for another project that I could sink my teeth into. And it might sound kind of masochistic, but I liked how long it took to make When I Rise. <laughs> I, it, it, it took, you know, several years and... There's something about working on a project over a long period of time that I feel like allows you to have perspective and reflect on things. Mm. And so, so I was looking for something also that would take a while to unfold. Oh, wow. Wyoming PBS, uh, P the PBS station is the only one in Wyoming, hired my production company, Alpheus Media in Austin, to work on a website project that involved Native American artifacts mm from the Wind River Reservation that had been removed from the reservation and given to museums. And what they wanted to do was create this learning tool basically for the tribes that live on the Wind River Reservation mm -hmm. to be able to kind of interact with these artifacts that were, you know, thousands of miles away uh, by sort of 360, you know, uh, rotations of these objects and then recording some elders talking about them. And uh -huh. so, this project kind of started that way, and I started to, to travel up to Wyoming to meet with the tribal councils, because first, before you really w do anything with the tribes or about the tribe, the way to go is to, to really make sure that the community is invested in, and wants to do it. Um, and so, especially dealing with sensitive things like these objects, yeah. I wanted to spend a good deal of time making sure they were okay with it. So. I went up and, and had a few trips where I just met with the councils and then started meeting some of the tribal elders. And one elder in particular, uh, his name is Philbert McLeod. He's Eastern Shoshone. And he started to talk to me about his experience in Vietnam and this object that he had in Vietnam that was given to him by an ancestor that helped him, uh, that he carried with him into battle it's in all kinds of really uh, tricky situations. And then at one point he said, oh, and by the way, um, I was an early adopter of Super 8 film, and I was allowed when I was there to shoot a lot of Super 8 of my <laughs> in battle and in, in the helicopter. And w I don't know if you'd be interested in seeing that. And I <laughs> tried to control my enthusiasm and said, yes, Robert, that would be very interesting. <laughs> that would be lovely, sir. <laughs> and so um, I started to go through his footage and it's just an amazing uh, story that, that his life is. And, and so I decided I wanted to make a larger doc around Philbert yeah. and uh, a girl named Michaela, who was a Northern Arapaho a dancer, a powwow dancer, and then a guy named Jordan Dresser, who I was working with as a local producer. I guess you could sort of call him a fixer. Um, hmm. I know some people don't like that term, but he was working with me on that the virtual museum project. And interesting things were happening in his life, too. He was starting to, he had just gotten done with his journalism degree and he was looking for ways to tell stories through history with objects. And he was asked to create a museum on the reservation. So I went into full fundraising mode and yeah. grant writing mode. And when I did that, I, I joined up with this awesome person named Joanna Ravenger, who is a, <laughs> we know her well. <laughs> I know you know, you know her and, and she's an awesome writer and just an intellect and a thinker. And she, just she and I, she never went to the reservation. And I think in some ways that was helpful because she was had this really kind of more of a big picture view about it. Uh, we spitballed things and she looked at footage and then we applied for all kinds of grants and went after ITVS open call. And, and after three tries, after three uh, or two really difficult rejections, <laughs> we, we got it on the third try. Wow. And then we got a grant from Vision Maker Media as well. Actually, we got Vision Maker Media first, and they were the first people to step up to the plate and say, we want to fund this project. And then the ITVS open call grant came after that. 
And it was a little bit, you know, of an uphill battle at the beginning, I think partially because I, as a non-native person trying to make a film with a native American perspective, it that's was right. definitely, I think I had some eyebrows that were raised. During- well, and, and that's something that I think we doc filmmakers um, can often be up against, certainly if we're filming in cultures very different from our own. I wonder if you can share with us, Matt, how you kind of navigated that, uh, how you navigated that part of, of your doc journey, because I imagine it, it takes a while to be able to get into good graces, not only with the elders and build the trust there, but then with the subjects themselves. Share a little bit about what that process was like for you. Well, I think generally uh, I could sum it up as I'm a pretty, I can be a pretty naive person <laughs> when I go into situations. And I, I think maybe I have an earnestness to a fault uh. about wanting to get to know people. And so a lot of that stuff, I just don't even see or pay that much attention to. Uh, <laughs> possibly I, I should a bit more, but but I, I, I've i always been kind of drawn in some way to trying to, um, I guess, tell stories about situations where there's a disempowerment at work or there's mm. something on where someone is disempowered. And to through the process of the film to try to in a way show how they how they became empowered yeah. through their own works uh through their own lives mm-hmm. like with when i rise it was kind of the same way with barbara conrad and and with what was ours um i mean frankly this i spent a lot of time just going to lunch with people and having coffee with people mm-hmm. and just becoming um close with them and and then also just wanting to make sure that you know, they understood that there was not a lot of I think a lot of uh, sort of in particular non-native filmmakers will sort of helicopter into a situation <laughs> and helicopter right back out. and Like I got my story yeah. and I was really interested in building long term relationships with people. I, I really like yeah. especially their families like I sort of I fell in love with the the place and the families and and then sort of felt very welcome there after a while. Yeah, that's kind of how that went. You know, that what something you have said there that immediately jumped out. We we had a a guest on the program, uh just an extraordinary woman by the name of Allison Wright and and part of what she talks about is she considers herself a, a documentary photographer as opposed to a photojournalist. And she really describes this idea of like, look, the photojournalists, in my view, they do this helicopter in, they get the story and then they get out. And, and she is much more immersive in her approach, um, a la what we do as doc filmmakers, hence her consent, calling herself a documentary photographer. It's a fascinating conversation. Anybody who's listening to the show, if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to Allison Wright. But yeah, that's what, that's what she's talking about. This idea of helicoptering in with a story and then getting out, you know, when you do that sort of thing as a doc filmmaker, if you think that your subjects don't pick up on that, or if you think that that's not adversely affecting your story in some way, um, I think people like you and I, Matt, would would beg to differ, correct? I mean, absolutely. And I think in some ways it makes the the, the process harder mm. uh, on the, the filmmaking team. Um, I have a, you know, I, I, I shoot a little bit but I definitely wouldn't call myself a DP, um, and I work with people that are that are great DPs and and audio people as well. Yeah. And I, I felt sorry for them in a way because in some ways you really have to um, put aside making schedules and sticking to a process and hitting <laughs> being in the best light and asking people to redo things. Can you walk through that door again, or can you, <laughs> yeah. on that, you know thing again and and you have to sort of askew that and figure out a way to cover it that is more authentic, that isn't directing too much. Uh, because I think also like in that kind of a situation, you know, there, there already was sort of a sense of, you know, and, and a lot of it is just hum- straight up humbleness and yeah. cautiousness about the perception of themselves in, in their community. And they, none of them really wanted to be stars or be, on TV, they they weren't seeking that, yeah. but they were seeking to kind of understand these issues, and they were going through something, and they uh, let us be involved in it. But uh, there's a lot of stuff in there where I'm like, I know that I could have, we could have shot that better, or we could have yeah. done this because we were all the way out here on this bluff 
overlooking this incredible place. But we didn't get the the super cinematic stuff because uh, wanted I didn't want to annoy the people that we were filming, and so I annoyed the crew instead. That's right, and, and it, it's such a fine line. It's you know when you're in that instance. And you you do feel for the crew because if you put yourself in the, as well, and if you put yourself in the position of being the shooter or being the sound person, you know, you're there because you're maybe interested in the project, but you're also there because you have a sort of a professional obligation to say the director or the producer of the project. And so you want to put forth your best foot forward, right? And, and in the case of a shooter or a DP, you want the best looking images that can tell the story. And, uh, but oftentimes you have to be kind of, yeah, wary of or aware of the situations that you're in. There are times when it's not appropriate to ask a subject to walk through the door again so you can get the shot. Did you ever find yourself, Matt, uh, having to dialogue either with a sound person or a DP about that, either after the fact, or did you have a conversation with them prior to shooting on the day um, about that sort of thing or about the sensitivity of what you were shooting and the people that you're working with? Well, I think that the people that I was working with really did understand yeah. kind of intuitively almost yeah. that, that that the people were somewhat uncomfortable with uh, being on camera. But yeah. we did have some things where I had to later on, you know, ask people, would you mind like it, it, like in the case of a sit down interview, um, if I was starting to feel like the person was opening up and forgetting that the camera was there, yeah. then, uh, you know, uh, someone says, can you re can can you redo that? There was a loud truck outside yes. or something like that. There are then you you listen to it back and it's like I do know that the sound guy wants it to sound great yeah. and wants to make sure that everything's motivated. Um, but at the same time, like I listen to it and I'm like, that's usable stuff, and it's more <laughs> to have the person be able to hold their train of thought yeah. and present with me in the moment than it is to ask them to restate something. So I did have some things like that where I had to. Be like, hey, please don't do that again with this particular person. Yeah, you definitely can sense when people become really present and lose self-consciousness yeah. as they're in a conversation with you. And I, I've done some shoots before where I was so worried about it that we actually built kind of like black. We use black drape and, you know, pipe and drape basically yeah. and stands to kind of close off the person from the crew. Sort of the Charlie Rose uh, show. Uh, yeah. But keeping the background still of the room still there, and so that's another idea of a way to kind of like shut the crew out. I've I've had to ask crew to like run cables and be in another room. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's just it. Sometimes it really is more important that the person is that you're able to get. And and at the end of the day, it's it's just, it is about getting the person to be able to either unburden themselves or experience something on camera that's real yeah. that they're experiencing internally inside themselves. And it's gotta be hard to do when you've got people tweaking lights or <laughs> someone yeah. coming in with anti shine, you know, like a little brush with it, you know, take the shine off their head or whatever. Right. And so it's, it's, but it is one of those things where it's, it's a writing a fine line. One thing I've learned is to just, Try to find a very quiet environment mm. and an environment where you're not going to be disturbed too much so that the crew isn't freaking out. Because you can feel the energy coming from the crew when they are freaking out. <laughs> some and I'm, my energy back at them is just let it lay. Yeah. Like this one is finally talking. Just like let's wait. Of course, you <laughs> want it in focus and you do want the camera to be running. Yeah. After I premiered my first documentary film, Journey to Kathmandu, a film that took nearly five years to make, I remember feeling elated and exhausted. Is there any other feeling like the first time you show your completed doc film to an audience? I don't think there is. Not long after, I took a well-deserved short break away from the city, and it was while I was on a hike, when I had reached a mountaintop and was overlooking the Great Columbia River, that I found myself thinking back on the film and the journey that I'd been on. I thought about all the mistakes I'd made, all the wins that I'd had, how it had felt to finally share my film with an audience, and I thought about the life it would have from here on out. And I began to break down all the components of what had gotten me to where I was at that moment, and all the things I wished I'd done differently. 
And this is how I began to form what I am sharing with you today, a free course entitled The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist. In the Essential Checklist, I share with you the fundamental aspects of making a documentary film, and perhaps most importantly, help you to avoid making some of the mistakes that I made during my first feature film. It is my sincere hope that The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist will help make your doc film's journey the truly exhilarating experience that it can and should be. It's yours simply by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses and enrolling for free. At what point in this stage are you thinking about independent lens again as someone who can bring on your film, uh, in particular here, obviously, with what was ours? Um, at the very beginning, yeah. um, they, they had done such an amazing job with When I Rise, and I had such a good time working with them that I, I really wanted to, to try to get on their radar again. And so having gotten the ITVS Open Call Fund, that it, it put us on their radar again. Mm. So that's something for filmmakers if you want to try to apply to ITVS Open Call, uh, and you get that, you're going to for sure be looked at by POV and Independent Lens, and it's not it's not like you're cold calling them or something. Right. So. So definitely they were aware of it and I was keeping in touch with them. Wouldn't it be funny if I gave you a tattoo? <laughs> Luckily, Rooster Teeth, a company that started with essentially three or four idiots, is now a company of uh, over 250 idiots. And a lot of them are in their 20s. Hey, Becca, have you tattooed anyone else before? No. Do you know how to give a tattoo? I mean, I will. I respect the hell out of tattooists. You're injecting ink into somebody's skin that's going to be there reasonably forever. If I screw up, they're going to live with my mistake forever. Let's talk a little bit about Rooster Teeth. I was unaware of Rooster Teeth, really, and uh, I'm glad that I know now, and I'm glad that I wasn't initially frightened away when I first went to their website. You kind of politely helped me understand um, Rooster Teeth and RT Docs. Tell our audience what Rooster Teeth is, who they are, and how you first got involved with them. Yeah, I have to say that your your message to me was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it made me laugh. No, I, uh, Rooster Teeth has, is really this... Um, I guess you could just call them a pioneering media company that yeah. that has been around since the early 2000s. And what they do is they create online series. I mean, they're probably the biggest creator of online series oh, wow. uh, throughout the world. Um, they were very early adopters of the internet, and they were doing things and releasing them directly to their community uh -huh. before anybody else, before YouTube even existed. Wow, so, wow, wow. Clearly, I should have known about these guys. I'm embarrassed and humbled. <laughs> Well, I mean, you might not be the right exact demographic. Mm. Uh, I would say they're, you know, they, they have their longest running web series is called Red versus Blue. And it's this hilarious uh, series that takes uh, gameplay videos from Halo and they add their own voices. And so they've created these characters <laughs> out of Halo. At the very beginning of that, um, Microsoft raised an eyebrow about that for sure because oh, it was a but then they, they became very successful. Then they got into other types of things like Ruby, uh, which is a, an anime show. Uh, it's very popular all the way around the world, including Japan. Uh, and then they do podcasts and um, other things that have to do largely with video game culture and internet culture. And, yeah. and how I got involved with them, um, I've known a few people that work there for a really long time. And I was always a fan of their shorts comedic shorts that were hilarious that were kind of kind of reminded me of the best Monty Python or kids in the hall kind of things. Oh. Uh, so they're here in Austin and okay, they, they are. I wondered, I thought so. Yeah. 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 They're here in Austin and they did this um, 30 minute documentary called let's play live that they sort of did just as an experiment to track this, this, uh, this thing that they were doing internally and they put it out and it got a lot of positive feedback. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, well, maybe we should do documentaries. So they met with, uh, myself and Beth Haynes, who's the executive producer at Alpheus and the rest of our team and said, do you guys want to work with us on some docs? And so we pitched oh, a wow. few What an opportunity. Yeah. They pitched a few things to us. We pitched a few things. And the first doc that we did together was, um, about, uh, addiction, smartphone addiction and technology addiction yeah. connected. And that was uh, that that was an idea pitched by my wife, um, who Beth, who 
we had little kids and we were struggling with this thing. And so we thought it would be funny to take two people who were in their 20s and are totally reliant on modern technology for their careers and try to <laughs> make them use technology that they had that existed the year they were born, which was 1989. <laughs> It's all of their stuff, their, you know, their, their computers with like fax machines and pagers and see, just to try to follow them for a week and see how they did. And uh, the results were pretty funny. And we, we were able to interview some heavy hitters like Nicholas Carr from, uh, he's a New York Times and the Atlantic writer who wrote a book on, on technology addiction called The Shallows. Um, and so it's kind of this ex social experiment that's peppered through with expert interviews that kind of give you the bigger context for what's going on. So, so I guess one of the first questions I have when I was kind of researching RT docs, okay, so where is the funding come to make these docs? Because these are not five or 10, 15 minute docs we're talking about here. We're often talking about 45 to 55 minute full on documentary films here. So where's the funding coming for all of this? Right. Uh, well, Rooster Teeth, basically they, they have, a lot of success with their other shows and they have a subscription platform um, that is available on iOS and Android and Xbox one, Apple TV and at roosterteeth.com. Mm. And so they've got, you know, I don't know how many, the 45 million subscribers across all of their, oh, wow. networks, I think um, 5 million subscribers on rooster teeth. Uh, so yeah, so it comes from, from the community itself. Incredible. And so if the community doesn't like, the content that Rooster Teeth is making for them, then it doesn't get made anymore. Yeah. And we're coming up on our 10th doc. Wow. Incredible. And with the RT docs from the, from the inception of idea, or let's say you get the okay to move forward with a particular project, how long, what's the turnaround time after you, um, you get the okay for, for an idea? Funny you should ask. Um, it's uh, it's kind of the exact opposite of the experience with what was ours and when I rise. I'll it's, bet. I'll bet. Which which in some ways I really like because yeah. it's kind of a I I kind of was reacting against those experiences with taking four to six years to make a doc. <laughs> so these docs usually from from the time that we get the green light to the time that it actually comes out sometimes. 10 weeks, uh, 15 weeks. Wow. Uh, incredible. Yeah. A few months. I mean, it's, it, it varies a little bit, but at, now I will say to be fair that the, the ideas tend to cook for a really long time. Yeah. Um, they don't make any decision lightly like, Oh, well, well let's just go do this tomorrow. It's usually there are conversations that have been happening for a long time. We've been working with them now for about two, two and a half years. Hmm. And so there are ideas that were talked about a couple of years ago that then finally, it's like, okay, we think it's the right time to do this. Right time to do it. It is, it is a quick turnaround, and a lot of times it does involve like international travel. Uh, for instance, we went to India once um, and had to plan and execute that shoot and then come back and had about, I think, about eight weeks to edit from there. Um, and yeah, the most recent doc that we did hasn't come out yet, and um, it's doing festivals right now, but it's called Waiting for the Punchline, right. and it's about stand-up comedy in San Francisco. And uh, we went to San Francisco, I think three different trips and each trip we were there for four days, five days, uh, following these comedians, uh, doing open mic nights. And so we would, it's kind of a nice way to work as you go and then you shoot a little bit, you come back, you watch everything and you make notes, update the treatment, and then you go back out again. And then by the time you're on your last leg of the filming, you really have honed in on the story and you know exactly what you need. Uh, to get and and the final interview and all that stuff. It's really you've kind of gotten it down to a process. I'll bet you do after <laughs> after nine or ten. I can I can imagine. Is this all being done through your yours and Beth's company, Alpheus Media, or and what I mean by that is, is the production run through you guys, or are you hired by RT Docs, or do they say, okay, look, or I mean, meaning are you hired by Rooster Teeth, or are they saying, look? thanks for the pitch. This is great. Here's a budget. Go run with it. You hire all the people. You make the film happen. In other words, how are you crewing up for this thing during production and post-production? Where are your, your people coming from? Yeah, well, in the opening credits on each of the docs, it's a Rooster Teeth production in association yeah. with Alpha Media. So it, essentially, it's kind of a mix of what you said. It's a, definitely 
it's a rooster teeth documentary. So it's their, yeah. you know, it's their property, but we make, we do the production. Um, they do have, uh, people involved in the production at every step. Um, so at the beginning it was this guy, Daniel Fabello, who's an awesome director over at rooster teeth that worked with me on, on all the docs. And then, uh, Doreen Copeland, and then, and now there's a uh, producer named Hannah McCarthy, who's super awesome. And she's, um, she's the RT docs producer. So she's sort of like the overseer of all things doc okay. within. And then she uh, works with us and w our staff to make the doc, but the production is all done by Alpheus. Uh, the uh, post has been done by Alpheus and sometimes rooster teeth. Okay. It kind of depends on what it really frankly depends on the, uh, what's in the pipeline at Alpheus and at Rooster Teeth mm. uh, to, in terms of the post. But I run kind of the directing all the way from pre-production and development through post. Let me ask you this. Can people approach, can, can a doc filmmaker approach Rooster Teeth with a film that is already finished if they feel like, hey, you know what, I think this is appropriate programming for Rooster Teeth. Will Rooster Teeth buy films outright in that way? I don't know. That's a great question. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't not try that. I mean, you definitely, they're very, uh, accessible on social media, on Twitter. And so I would say they probably get a hundred pitches a day. I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> uh, wow, bet. but, uh, but there's definitely a process that they probably have set up and I'm sure you could find it on their website. So my question now, Matt is, are you making your doc films kind of almost exclusively through Rooster Teeth now? Or do you have a separation there? Are there the the docs that you want to work with via RT? And then you have your own documentary projects that are separate from that? Or how is that working for you now? Well, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I like to think of it as a little bit of both, which doesn't really answer your question. I, I think the Rooster Teeth docs are their own brand um rt docs is its own thing right and for sure they could work with other documentary filmmakers so i don't necessarily uh think that that i'm doing exclusive rt docs or, or they're exclusive with me but i i will say that um that i don't really have time for anything <laughs> anything else right now. <laughs> yeah hey you're making films man yeah it's a busy it's a busy um it's a busy process to kind of meet these deadlines but but I do have other projects that I have in the works yeah. uh, that are independent of Rooster Teeth, working on a couple of things right now. One is about water uh, and all things water and water history. Uh, oh, that's a big one. That is a big one right now. Yeah. And, and so that's been an ongoing thing that we're going to be shopping to PBS. Um, and it's actually almost finished. I have a rough cut pretty much done. And then uh, doing a six-part series of 60-minute uh, docs on uh, energy and mm -hmm. the relationship between energy and kind of modern life. I'm working with a professor at the University of Texas and an author named Michael Weber. And so it's all his kind of his thing that we're adapting into films, uh, six different films. So that that is an ongoing project that's going to have me traveling all around over the next few months. Too. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, in many ways, you are of these tiny percentage of filmmakers that we either have here on the program um, or who are listeners of the program who makes in many ways their entire living doing the documentary work. I mean, you have found a way to do it and, and it's brilliant. And more than that, um, you're making more films. I mean, with your association with Rooster Teeth, um, as much as I know that you loved the four and five and six year immersion, you're all, you're also by working by working for and with them, you're producing uh, more films out there into the world. So uh, that's pretty incredible stuff, and uh, I commend you for that. It's uh, you're truly living the doc life there, my friend. Matt, what an absolute pleasure having you on the program. It's been great meeting you. Do you have any maybe final parting words for a doc filmmaking audience? Yeah, I would. I would say that, you know, if you're interested in making a doc, you should just pick up a camera and start doing it. And I also think that it's really important to to write like writing all the time, I think, has really been helpful for me to kind of build up my storytelling muscles mm -hmm. in being able to do stocks faster when when it is required. So I would say write a treatment. You know, try to really make sure there's a structure there before you go off and start shooting. I know that kind of contradicts what I said earlier about picking up a camera, but 
I think the more you can write and see it on paper, maybe work with a grant writer like Joanna Ravenger, someone like that. I think writing is just kind of an underrated skill in documentary filmmaking. And um, I think you'll be a lot more focused going into a project and be able to describe it better to potential funders and distributors too, if you actually, you know, write a, a treatment. Brilliant. That's specific advice. I don't know if that was the inspiration you were looking for, but it is. It's great. <laughs> it's a great takeaway. What's the best way that we can see some of your work, Matt, whether it's your own work or whether it's uh, with the RT docs? Yeah. Uh, when I rise is on, uh, is available to rent on Netflix on DVD. And then you can also get it on pbs.org and Amazon. Uh, and then Amazon prime has what was ours streaming right now. And then it's going to stream again on PBS's website, uh, this fall on independent lens. And then, uh, the RT docs you can watch, uh, at roosterteeth.com. And of course, we'll have links to all those up in the show notes for this episode. Matt Hames, thank you so much for being on the program. We look forward to seeing what's up next for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much. Don't forget, if you're interested in a guide to help you navigate the fundamental aspects of doc filmmaking, the things that every doc filmmaker should know, then get our free doc filmmaking course, The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist, by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next episode. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.